Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick from Smart Drive Test talking to you today about happy holiday driving and avoiding or at least dealing and having a happy uh, conclusion to an incident of road rage. So stick around. We'll be right back with that information. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about happy holiday driving, getting through the holidays. Because unfortunately for some of us, it's not a happy festive time. For some, it's white knuckle driving, driving in snow, getting through the parking lots, crowded, crazy parking lots where everybody and their friend is there. Uh, you know, except unless you're at Walmart, because I remember reading in one of the texts, uh, you know, traffic, why we drive the way we do, uh, that... Walmart builds its parking lots for maximum capacity at Christmas time. So that's a different uh, <laughs> different idea compared to the rest of them. But anyway, if you're just tuning in here, let us know where you're tuning in from in the world. Let us know which class of license you're going for, how we can help you, and as well, what shopping mall you're going to be going to at Christmas. So let us know that as well. Ryan is here checking in from Regina. Sign Cutter is here from North Dakota. And I suspect they have lots of uh, snow and ice there in North Dakota. Katie's here working towards a permit to, to drive a car. Rich is here uh, checking in from rain-soaked Maine. So they're not getting snow in Maine. They're getting uh, rain there. Carrie's here from Minnesota. Looking forward to tonight. Excellent. And uh, just before we start here, <laughs> thank you everybody for moving to Monday. Uh, I didn't quite give this the thought that I should have given it and I should have started a little bit I either had it this morning or later this afternoon because I had to go and pick the kids up <laughs> and that's why we're starting at 3.15 so I get back here and my face is a little bit red it's pretty cold outside so that's what's going on a uh, question I wanted to answer one of my smart drivers lives in Minnesota asked me if he should go and get his license in the winter time do the training and those types of things and I said, absolutely, you should go and do your training for your license and learning how to drive in the winter time. Because if you do those things in the winter time, you're going to be a better driver when you come to summertime. Driving in rain and in snow and ice and our sleet, fog, those types of things when spring and summer comes. So uh, I strongly encourage you to learn how to drive in the winter time. I strongly encourage you to go and get your road test in the winter time again. As I say to students about getting your license in the winter time, it's less exact. You don't have to park 8 to 12 inches away from the curb when you're parallel parking. You simply have to park in behind the vehicle in front of you. Because if you get back into the snowbank and you get stuck, the examiner's not going to push you out. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're just probably going to get out of the car and they're going to walk back to the test center. So it's less exact. As well, you don't have to stop at the stop line. Uh, at intersections, if there's snow banks and those types of things, you simply have to come up, stop before the sidewalk, and then creep out so you can see, and then proceed. So it's a lot less exact in the winter time. That's one of the little known things that people don't know about getting their license and learning to drive in the winter time. It's not as exact as it is in the summertime. So I strongly encourage you to think about that and getting your license in the winter time as opposed to in the summertime, especially if you're living in Minnesota or North Dakota or Maine where they have lots of snow and those types of things. Uh, Krista, uh, cold and rainy California. You must be in Northern California there, Krista, for it to be rain and cold. Uh, Fidel, Salt Lake City, uh, is getting your hazmat endorsement worth it? Absolutely, Fidel. If uh, hazmat, for, so just the smart drivers, that uh, that's for CDL. Hazmat is so you can pull hazard, hazardous materials. And the thing, Fidel, the reason I tell you to get your hazmat, hazmat endorsement is, many items that we wouldn't even think about are considered hazmat. So if you have, for example, 100 pounds of paint, household paint on your trailer, that's considered hazardous material. If you're carrying a load of bleach, that's considered hazardous material and you have to have your hazmat endorsement. It only It's only two or three hours to get your hazmat endorsement and it is so worth it because you're that much more employable. So strongly encourage you to get your hazmat, have that as a CDL driver, and you're gonna be much more employable and much more attractive to an employer. All right, uh, Michael's here. Uh, Varun, hello, Katie. Uh, they, don't, they won't do testing for written or driving if we have snow in Arkansas. <laughs> That's not surprising, Katie. That's not surprising. Mervin, hello, can you put a video up uh, that shows us the various driving tips like hanging, um, hanging on hills with clutches, 
Uh, you're from Sierra Leone. Uh, and um, your name's Mervyn Jones. Mervyn, yes, Sierra Leone. Hello, welcome from Sierra Leone. I think that's the first time we've had somebody from Sierra Leone. And there is your Trivial Pursuit question for the day. Out of the American Revolution, what were the five countries that were created as a result of the American Revolution? And I'll let you know the answer here at the end. Arif, I'm uh, tuning in from Australia. I passed my provisional license test. No problems. Thanks, Rick. Also, it's warm and sunny here. Yes, uh, it is December and it is beginning of summer in Australia. Arif, where are you in Australia? Which state are you in? Uh, Michael, the traffic one winter. My mom nearly blocked the intersection with me and the family car. Okay, Fidel, excellent. Krista, I'm in the mountains by Yosemite. I'm learning to drive in the rain and snow. I had to return to the Smart Drive Test channel. <laughs> well, welcome back. Jaden, hello. Yes, and you're pointing up there. I missed your comment, Jaden. There we go. Uh, done with my learner's permit license and about to get my driver's license. Awesome. Congratulations, Jaden. Jaden has been here. Uh, one of the Smart Drivers has been here for a while, and that is awesome. We've been helping Jaden out, and Jaden, that is just absolutely stellar news. Excellent. Uh, Varun, I'm tuning in from Brampton. I missed you yesterday. Yes. I uh, actually wasn't on yesterday, Varun. I had Christmas with my mom, who's visiting from Ontario, uh, there in Wingham. So, sign cutter, I'm starting my CDL training in January here in North Dakota. I'd much rather gain uh, the instructor's knowledge in the winter versus summer. Yes, and I strongly encourage you to do that sign cutter, especially there in North Dakota. All right, so we're going to get going here. Uh, a lot of people on here today. It's very busy. Uh, that's great. Um, one of the things that I'm planning to do for the new year, just catching up on some of the news here, house cleaning and those types of things. One of the things I want to do in the summertime is I'm going to start doing two live streams a week. I'm going to start doing one for new drivers, which is going to stay on Sunday as the Smart Sunday, uh, uh, the Smart Sunday live session for new drivers getting their first license. And then I'm going to do another live stream during the week for CDL drivers and it's going to be specifically CDL information. I'm going to be helping CDL drivers uh, get their endorsements as Fidel was saying about hazmat endorsement, tanker endorsement, uh, trains endorsements, um, air brakes, all those types of things. So I'm going to be doing another live stream probably on Wednesday I'm thinking. I'll, I'll run a poll in the community tab and see what works best for people. Uh, I might even run it later in the day, but it's going to be specifically for people doing CDL, so I'm going to do that as well. Epic, hello my friend, happy holidays. Uh, speaking of road rage, do they tend to occur peak travel season, Thanksgiving, 4th of July? Uh, because I was on the highway with my dad, there was a driver doing an unsafe pass. Um, Epic, it can, that is one of the things, and I'll talk a little bit more about reasons why people tend to road rage a little bit more. I'll give you some examples of my own incidences of road rage and give you some insight into that. Uh, Mervyn, uh, tell us when you are going to put that video up as long as it's helpful a lot. Uh, Mervyn, there is a video here. Uh, I haven't seen Corey yet. I don't know whether Corey's gonna be able to show up today. Corey usually does the moderation here. But uh, if one of the other smart drivers could find the video on hill parking, I think that's the one that's Mervyn's looking for and put that link up, that would be really helpful. Uh, Katie, if you were driving down a street, how do you prevent from blocking the intersection when the road is full of cars? Uh, you're, you're simply going to have to block the intersection. I can't see any other way that you'd be able to do that, Katie. If, if there's cars on both sides and it's a narrow street and you can't get out into the intersection, I'm not sure what else you, you could do there. All right, so we'll come back. I'm going to do the presentation and uh, then I'll come back and I'll answer questions <clears throat> Excuse me for the remainder of the hour here as well uh, super chat is available uh, if you want to have a question answered for sure drop us a bit of money here that's always great uh, as I said we're trying to help out and so anybody who's uh, earned a license we ask them to go over and sign up for the 100k campaign and make a donation and that money is currently going to raise a wheelchair for Anne and we need to raise about $25,000 because electric wheelchairs as you may or may not know are incredibly expensive so that's what we're going to do so bear with me, I'm gonna get through the PowerPoint presentation here. So holiday driving is what we're talking about today. And uh, my name is Rick August and I'm on the wrong screen, technical difficulty. There we go. So Rick August, I was a truck driver through most of the 1990s. I ran between the United States and Canada. 
hauling uh, mostly LTL freight. LTL stands for less than a load. It simply means that you have five or six drops on a truck. And mo I did for a period of time run New Jersey, uh, New York City, Philadelphia, Florida. Anything pretty much east of the Mississippi is where I did, but mostly going into cities and dropping off offsprings for a long period of time. 1997, in a bid to move on from being an over-the-road truck driver I got my commercial license driver's license driving instructor's license is what I'm trying to say uh, most of my career has been involved with teaching drivers uh, commercial drivers truck drivers bus drivers air brakes and those types of things uh, I also did some work with driver rehabilitation uh, helping people who had debilitating injuries return to driving or had lost a limb driving with hand controls and those types of things 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with a degree in legal history, my doctorate in legal history. Uh, study, for those of you who may or may not know, uh, legal history is the study of policing courts and prisons, and my expertise is in uh, policing as it relates to traffic, oddly enough. So during the time that I was at university, I drove buses for Greyhound and one of the regional bus lines there as well. So I have a lot of drive, professional uh, CDL driving experience. So that's who I am in a nutshell. And as well, one of the other places that you can find me and other smart drivers and talk to other smart drivers about road tests and uh, becoming a CDL driver and whatnot is the Facebook Mastermind Group. We have that over there and as well, uh, you can find the link down in the description there uh, and head over there and join up for that and share your knowledge as well because not Every one of us, not even me, with the amount of experience, driving experience I have, can answer all of your questions. And oftentimes I put questions out to smart drivers and they're able to help each other out. So this is one of the videos that I might suggest that you have a look at if you haven't uh, looked at multi-turning lanes, especially for those of you who might be living in rural areas and you need to take your test in a city area. If uh, you're gonna go into a city, you're gonna encounter multi-turning lanes, two lanes to the left or two lanes, two turning lanes to the right. And this video will give you a refresher on how to turn at those lanes. So today we're talking about holiday driving. And the first thing that I can not stress enough, give yourself more time. It's, it's simply going to take more time to get into the malls, to get out of the malls because the malls are busy. Uh, they're at their peak season, Christmas season, the two or three weeks before Christmas. Actually, <laughs> we'll repeat that. Uh, in the United States of America, it's the last Thursday after Thanksgiving, the Friday after Thanksgiving until Christmas. It's the biggest shopping period in the United States of America. Other countries are similar, different cultures obviously, but you simply must absolutely allow yourself more time and allow yourself more patience. If you don't do that, it's going to lead to road rage. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be angry. It's not going to be a fun time. You definitely want to go to the store and buy gifts for your loved ones and your friends and have fun doing it because we you know, we don't want to be <laughs> all right so parking lots know the parking lots are going to be busy allow yourself extra time do not be con convicted or uh you know chained to the idea that you need to park next to the door of the of the shop uh you know if you have physical disabilities that prevent you from walking from the back of the parking lot then you know, perhaps consider getting a parking pass so that you can park in the uh, disabled stalls and those types of things. But allow yourself extra time. Scan visually. You know, cover the brake if you're at the least bit sure of what's going on. Whether a car is backing out or whether people are walking through the the parking lot corridors and those types of things. And you know, especially if uh, children are present. You know, sometimes the younger kids can be a little bit. Uh, unpredictable in what they do they can get away from their parents and run and you know be excited because they're going to the store or they're going to see Santa Claus in the mall or whatnot so be very aware and go slowly through parking lots <laughs> go slowly because if you go slowly you have more time to scan you have more time to react and you have more time to maneuver the vehicle so go slowly in parking lots I cannot stress that enough during the holiday period Reversing, one of the, the number one reason why people have backing crashes is because they move the vehicle first and then they look. It's the complete reverse of what you should be doing and it's the complete reverse of what you should be doing on a road test if you wanna pass, uh, pass the road test. 
you must look first before putting the vehicle into motion. You must do a 360 degree scan around your vehicle and you should be looking out the back window. If not, at least using your wing mirrors and using your backup camera. For those of you driving newer vehicles, use the backup camera. Do a 360 degree view. And for every vehicle length that you're going to be backing up, stop, pause, do another 360 degree scan around the vehicle and look for children, pedestrians, and other road users in and around the parking lot because it's not just going to be people walking through the parking lot or cars moving through the parking lot. It's also the people working at the shops who are bringing uh, shopping carts back into the mall and those types of things. It's going to be people wheeling their cart out with their groceries and their all their goods that they purchased, their Christmas gifts and those types of things, and they're going to be loading them in the car. So take note of your surroundings. It's the same thing as interpreting traffic patterns when you're on the roadway. In malls, you have to interpret uh, the actions of individual road users in the parking lot because if people are walking through the parked cars, you can kind of figure out where they're going and what they're doing. Uh, if a car is sitting in the stall and there's exhaust emanating from the tailpipe and the windows are all clear and uh, you can see the person sitting in the seat and then you see the reverse lights come on, you can be almost certain that that person is going to be backing out of that stall. So you might have to stop and wait for them to get out and also know that some people are not going to be able to back out very well. They don't back out enough and then they have to pull forward and they have to back out again. So take note of all of that and know that that's going to happen when you're driving. Now of course you have to do winter driving and of course there's the playlist here on the Smart Drive Test channel about winter driving and it'll give you a lot of information about that, about how to drive well in the winter time. If there is snow and ice, <laughs> Note that it's going to be more slippery when the temperature is around zero, when it's around 36 degrees or 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. Okay, just know that. So you're going to need even more time because it's going to be more slippery. Make sure that your vehicle is well maintained. If you haven't taken it in already, now is a good time to get it in, get it checked, make sure everything's working well. Get your snow tires, get good tires mounted on your vehicle if you don't have that already. And also know that if you live in a place in Minnesota or North Dakota, you know Duluth, Minnesota, where they have tons and tons of snow. Uh, that in the winter time in parking lots, there's going to be even less parking spaces because they need to pile up the snow and they need to move the snow. And this is another thing that you could be contending with in parking lots is plow equipment, trucks and skid loaders and those types of things. And but in the winter time, uh, you know most of the time they try and do that at night. But if it's snowing during the day, those plow vehicles are going to be out and they're going to be in the parking lots trying to keep them clear so people can get in and get out and get in and get their shopping done. So that's the other thing they're going to try and do. Now, load security. And <laughs> this is always good fun. How are you going to get your goods home if they don't fit into your vehicle? You know, and of course, you get the fridge on the top of the trunk here, all tethered down to the back of the vehicle. Uh, you have to realize that uh, you know this is going to affect the steering and the braking of the vehicle and you're not going to be safe driving up and down the roadway. So you have to figure out how you're going to get it home. Are you going to pay to have it delivered by a delivery company or the shop that you purchased it from or whatnot? Sometimes it's worth the $50 to just get them to deliver it and then you're not you know, trying to get it loaded into your vehicle and whatnot. So think about load security. If you're bringing your Christmas tree home, make sure that you have it tied down to your vehicle securely. You don't want it blowing off on the roadway when you're going home. And if you do see a load that's you know questionable when you're driving down the road and those types of things, keep away from it. It's, it's, it's similar to vehicles that the, the driver has not cleared the snow off the top of the vehicle or the windows or those types of things. Just give them lots of space, you know? <laughs> Let them go and drop the snow somewhere else on the roadway, not in front of you that could potentially, you know, impede your ability to drive and cause you to get into trouble when you're driving. So know that as well. So think about load security if you're buying big purchases and those types of things. Now, the other thing that you need to think about at Christmas time, if you're going to be doing this, traveling to meet friends or traveling for holidays and whatnot, think about navigation and route planning, especially if you haven't been there before. So there's the video on navigation route planning. Look at that. It'll show you how to use your phone. It'll show you how to use Google Maps and those types of things and get you there safely. If you're traveling with your family, plan your stop stops every couple of hours. Think about activities for children. Where are you going to stop that they can go in and maybe you can stop at the coffee shop and have a bit of a snack and a coffee. You know, get out and go for a bit of a walk. Maybe stop at the playground. The kids can get out and have some play and those types of things. Think about all of that. 
And again, for those of you who are CDL drivers, Boston truck drivers, uh, if you haven't been to where you're going before, you're going to a different place and whatnot, have a look at these videos on trip planning. There's one for Canada and there's one for the United States of America as well. Both those videos will really help you out in terms of planning your trips, getting there safely, and you know managing your fatigue. Because this is the other thing that the reason that you're stopping every couple of hours, you're getting out of the vehicle, and you're walking around, and you're getting the blood flowing and those types of things, and you are managing your fatigue so you don't fall asleep at the wheel. All right, Christmas parties. I know we haven't got to road rage yet, but just bear with me. We're going to get there and talk about road rage. Okay, Christmas parties. Plan your ride before you start drinking because after you start drinking, you do not make rational decisions. <laughs> At least I don't make the best decisions in the life after I've had a beer or two. So think about how you're going to get home even before you start drinking. Are you going to bring a cab? Are you going to take the bus? Are you going to get somebody else to drive you and those types of things? Now, the other piece, and I've talked about this before, especially for young people, MADS contract for life. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, they have a contract for life, and essentially it's, it's an agreement between parents and their kids. That's what it was designed for, teenage drivers, that the two of you agree that no matter where the other person is, if they've been drinking and they need a ride home, or the person that they went with has been drinking and they need a ride home, the other person will come and get them no matter what time, no matter where they are, and no questions asked. And I would encourage you strongly that if you haven't broached this topic already with your parents about how you're going to get home safely, look down in the description, get the link, get the contract for life, and discuss this with somebody who will come and get you, somebody that you trust to come and get you if you've been at a party and you've been drinking, you know, imbibing, and you need to get home safely. So think about that, okay? Traffic, how are you, you know, how are you going to deal with traffic, uh, you know, uh, other people that may have been drinking and driving, especially if you live in rural areas, that's inevitable. Especially on the weekend, Friday at 1 or 2 in the morning, Saturday 1 or 2 in the morning, and other traffic is driving, they're wandering around the roads and those types of things. Again, give them lots of space, keep away from them, let them go and have their crash somewhere else, and if you're concerned about public safety, then you can call the police and say, hey, this vehicle is you know, wandering up and down the roadway and could potentially cause a crash. I think the driver might be drunk. All right, so getting home in the wintertime, here's a list. And again, this will be on the video and the replay so you can go through these again. Uh, ways that you can get home uh, if you have been drinking. And as my mom says, get drunk and be somebody. There, you, Therefore, you could fly home as a superhero. Take a cab, ride the bus. Most bus systems, most transit systems, especially on New Year's Eve, are free. Get a designated driver, but be sure to give the driver cash for gas. You could walk home. You could run in spurts because running continuously is just too hard. You could crawl home, but you know, make sure that you wear your snow pants because, of course, there's going to be snow in many places. Uh, drive home the next day. That way you get a free breakfast from whoever you stay over with. Uh, get your drunk friend to give you a piggyback ride home. Uh, take the shuttle service offers by respective establishments where you've been drinking. Lots of hotels and those types of bars and whatnot will have a shuttle, and they'll actually drive you home. Uh, have a bash at your party. It's a great way to have a big slumber party. You know, uh, go to the pizza shop, order a pizza to be delivered to your home address and catch a ride with the pizza delivery guy. And if that doesn't work, China, try the Chinese place. And then finally, the best tip for Christmas, don't fry bacon in the nude. It's a great tip. All right. So there you go. How you get home. So road rage. We're going to talk about road rage. We're going to talk about instances of people getting upset <laughs> when they're driving. And what is road rage? Is it just when somebody flips you off and gives you the bird while you're driving because you accidentally cut them off or you didn't do something that they thought was what you should be doing according to the road rules and road culture and whatnot? No, aggression is usually somebody either getting out of their vehicle and being physically aggressive towards you, threatening violence, or they're using their vehicle as a weapon to cut you off or do a brake check in front of you, especially on freeways. I have seen this where vehicles will pass another vehicle aggressively cut back in front of them and then do a brake check. So they slam on the brakes and hit the brake lights, causing the person behind them to react. <laughs> and not often, not always in the best way. So know that people are on edge. People want to get to their destination as quickly as possible. And they, if they think that you're impeding them or you're doing something contrary to road rules or road culture, they could potentially get upset. They could potentially get out of their vehicle and they could yell at you. Uh, they could bang on your windows and those types of things. First and foremost, do not make eye contact. 
Do not take your camera out and take pictures of them. Simply roll up the window, lock the doors, do not engage with them, and simply try to drive away. If you do drive away and they follow you, then drive to a police station. Do not drive to your house. <laughs> you don't, the last place, <laughs> the last thing you want somebody who's being aggressive uh, towards you is to have them follow you to your house. You don't want that to happen. So don't drive to your house, drive to a police station. Okay? Breathe. All right? Oftentimes, people who are angry and people who are showing signs of aggression to you can only sustain anger for a maximum of two minutes. So once they get it out of their system and they scream and yell at you and they call you every name in the book, they're just going to go back, get in their car, and they're going to drive away. It's very seldom that acts of road rage actually result in physical violence towards you. If you do the things that I told you to do, don't unlock your doors, don't roll down your windows, don't make eye contact, don't be taking pictures of them with your phone because all of that is going to escalate their aggression. Simply don't engage and drive off and drive to a police station if you think that they're following you and those types of things. Know that it's gonna happen, breathe. And as well, plan shorter trips into longer trips so you're not going out doing short trips back and forth and all the time, that kind of thing because that will reduce the amount of road rage as well. And I'll, when we do question and answer period, because I feel this is, I want to wrap this up, I'll give you a couple of examples of road rage as well that I've been involved in and how they went down in the end. All right, so the other thing, because it's the holidays and because Christmas is a time of giving, we want to practice some courtesy and we want to practice some act, random acts of kindness, especially as smart drivers, because that's what we do. We smile. It doesn't take any time out of our day to be nice to other people. And we don't need to just practice this at Christmas. Let's practice this, you know, all year round. So random acts of kindness. If you go to the drive through at the coffee shop, buy the vehicle behind you a cup of coffee and then just drive off, you know, leave the dollar in the shopping cart or I don't know how much it is in the States, whether it's $2 or whatnot, but we have coins here in Canada. Uh, you know, leave the coins in the, in the shopping cart and just have the shopping cart for the next person to come along. And, you know, let somebody in. If you're waiting for a parking space, or you're waiting to turn out onto a roadway or something, let somebody in and make sure that you smile because, you know, it's a time of giving. It's a time of Christmas. And as I say, and I repeat this again and again and again, it doesn't take any time out of your day to be nice to someone. So keep that in mind as you're driving. All right, over at the Smart Drive Test website, just quickly mention this, the winter driving course is on sale for $27. So consider that. Uh, topics of discussion in the winter driving course, it'll take you about two, maybe three hours. It's a self-paced online course. Common crashes, gearing up, uh, white knuckle driving, uh, throwing down. So dealing with everything that old man winter throws down. Uh, talking about fatigue and how to manage that and then of course in the last lesson you'll be learning about navigation so that course is available over at the smart drive test website uh, have a look down in the description there and you can find the link for that or just head over to the smart drive test website and you can find the winter driving course on special for $27 all right so good luck in your road test and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer so we'll just transfer back over here and we'll start answering questions and answers questions anybody has excellent and Corey is here bricks for wheels hello Corey okay Katie if you were driving down a street okay we've answered that question excellent Epram uh, would you drop a video how to secure and strap loads on semi trucks Okay, Ephraim, I haven't done that video yet, but I'll definitely put that on a list of four videos to be able to do, okay? Okay, Michael, uh, going home, cops stopping you, LOL. <laughs> All right, okay. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's to you. I'm very thankful for your help to be a smart driver on the road. Ephraim, yes, and I'm glad that we can help you out and welcome as part-time uh, being part of the Smart Driver community, it's always greatly appreciated. So, excellent. Awesome. So, the Prince uh, brake checking can lead to vehicle impoundment and license suspension in Ontario. Yes, and but the, the problem with that, Prince, and this is the problem with a lot of uh, laws and regulations that are in place, is that we can have these laws and regulations in place. The question becomes is who is policing that? And the other thing with a brake check, 
when I'm defining a break check, what I'm talking about is an act of aggression where somebody who thinks that you cut them off or you did something contrary to road rules and they're ticked off at you, they're, you're on a high speed highway, you're going down the road and the person cuts in front of you and then slams on their brakes and so you could potentially rear end them. The problem with that is it's, it's such a short term event. It's incredibly short term. Uh, it's, it's over in 10 or 15 seconds. So unless a police officer is actually there, the chances of you getting caught are slim, really slim or somebody else getting caught. And even if it goes to court, if somebody reports it to the police and the police come out and investigate and those types of things, it's probably not going to happen. So what and this comes back to what I say to you again and again and again. Sometimes it's better just to take your foot off the throttle and let the other person go off and have their crash somewhere else. Because if you get involved, if you engage, it's going to escalate. You're going to do this, the next person's going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, and the next thing you know, you are into a situation that you could, you, you could potentially sustain serious injury. You could end up in a hospital. Because if the person decides to use their car as a weapon, and you got out of your car to confront this person, and the person just runs over you, because that potentially could happen because your car is a weapon, is it worth it? <laughs> Whereas... Had you just taken a breath, go, okay, this person is upset, I'm not going to engage, and you either just stop and let them carry on with their life, or you, you know, they're pounding on your window, you just don't engage, keep the door locked, and you just drive off, it's, the, all of this is so much better than, than the alternative of ending up in a hospital or, or being dead because you're in a car crash at a high speed or something like that. So these things do happen, so you need to think very seriously about your reaction to a road rage situation. Ryan, uh, in holidays, do we have to be careful with distracted drivers also? The fine here in Saskatchewan for that is going to be higher in February. Yes. Uh, Ryan, I wouldn't just think that distracted driving is going to happen during the holidays. Distracted driving is going to happen any time of the year. Yes, there's a possibility that people can be more distracted, i.e. phones at Christmas time because, you know, they're talking to their loved ones and their husbands at home cooking the turkey and whatnot and they say oh you know can you get some uh some some chicken spice or can you you pick up some nutmeg or something like that uh you know they forgot something and they need to be looking at their phone and those types of things i very strongly encourage you not to be using your cell phone while you're driving wait till you get to the grocery store or pull over on the side of the road if you need to use your phone to talk to somebody else uh, because they're sending you a text for you to pick something up at the store and those types of things. Yes, distracted driving is a problem. Yes, it's on the rise because of, and it's not just cell phones. It's also the telematics in our vehicles, all of the communications and, uh, you know, access to the internet, but not in our cars, talking to pedestrian or talking to other passengers in the vehicle, all of the distractions that are going on, road signs, for example, <laughs> you know, good looking people walking down the sidewalk, all of these are distractions. So, you know, whether it's increases at Christmas, no, it's not going to increase it at Christmas, but there are going to be more people on the roadways, which could lead to more distraction at uh, Christmas. All right, uh, Varun, uh, what if an enraged driver points a gun at you? Is it better to duck or throw a punch? Throw a punch? No, if uh, Varun, if if somebody points a gun at you, it's it's best just to, if you can, drive off, get out of the situation. Uh, hopefully, you're not in an area in a place where that happens. Now, the, you know, I can't say no. This isn't going to happen. Uh, I had an awful story for from a smart driver living in Detroit. Uh, you know police prejudice and those types of things it does happen I'm not saying that it doesn't happen I don't live in a world with complete blinders on but you know if somebody points a gun at you you need to either figure out how to get your if you're still in your vehicle and you're still driving you need to figure out how to get somewhere else so that they're not pointing a gun at you anymore all right okay epic uh, speaking of commercial driver's license for school buses uh, do they need a body fluid cleanup kit or not uh, uh, okay, so Epic, I think I know what you're talking about. So if somebody is sick on the bus or those types of things, yes, they have all of that cleanup uh, materials on the bus. I know when I drove for Greyhound, when we, we had people who were sick on the bus, uh, we did have cleanups. We had mops and disinfectants and soaps and those types of things on the bus 
So they are there. And, you know, sometimes if the person is legitimately sick, they will clean it up themselves. If not, if, you know, unfortunately you let a drunk driver onto your bus, then you're going to have to clean it up. I've had a couple of incidences of that, which is not any fun at all. Not any fun at all. Jamie Rockstar, I don't understand how people can text and drive. I tried it. I uh, tried to change songs on my phone on a back road and was car, uh, the car started going in the other direction. <laughs> yes, Jamie Rockstar, and you'd be surprised. And it's not just your phone, Jamie, uh, in terms of trying to change the, you know, change the songs or change whatever on your phone while you're driving. It, it's also changing a radio station on your, when you're driving down the road and those types of things. And, you know, but it happens all the time. Or somebody's trying to get the thermos out of the footwell on the passenger side and they're leaning over trying to get the, uh, you know, get the thermos to pour themselves a cup of coffee while they're driving down the road and those types of things. So, you know, it's not just what's on your phone. It's also things in the car that can distract you as well. And, you know, if you drop something in the footwell on the passenger side and you need it for driving in those things, you know, don't reach down, you know, trying to, ah, trying to get it. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're hanging on to the steering. You're not, you're not paying attention. You're completely distracted, completely distracted. Okay. All right. Uh, Michael does get somewhere else mean speed. If you're going to the speed limit and they're pointing a gun at you. Uh, I don't know. Okay. So I know that for some of you living in the United States, that this gun thing is a, is a reality, but like I said, don't be in that place where potentially people could be doing that, right? Uh, you know, just go somewhere else. <laughs> just go somewhere else. Uh, Carrie, if someone does something crazy on the road, what is the best way to calm down, reduce anxiety right after it happens? I drive better when it's when I'm less anxious and calm. Yeah, Carrie, definitely some of these situations are going, you know, you have a near-miss crash, for example. You're going to be, you know, the adrenaline's going to be flowing. You're going to be, you're going to be kind of crazy. Uh, sometimes it's best just to pull over and take a few minutes to calm down because it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to get you. <laughs> I've had a couple of situations like that where I just need to pull over, take a breath and then carry on afterwards. Uh, I've had a few near misses. So know that, that you're just going to have to pull over, take a minute, calm yourself down and then carry on. Especially if you have a road rage incident. Uh, Michael, anytime you reach for something, the car is going to go off. Yes. Well, <laughs> hopefully not but people do that kind of crazy stuff where they're leaning over to get something out of the footwell uh, okay Michael how do you go somewhere else if you're gonna if you're going the maximum speed limit okay Michael this is a perfect example and I see this in movies all the time where they're being chased by the bad guys what <laughs> vehicles don't just go forward <laughs> Vehicles stop too. Use the brake. Get off the road. Let them go past you. You know, you don't just have to keep driving at the speed limit if somebody's pointing a weapon at you or threatening you. You know, get your foot on the brake. Stop the vehicle. Pull over. Uh, get out of the way. Go, let them go somewhere else. Let them go wherever they're going with their weapon and those types of things. You know, this is what you need to do. And I see this in movies all the time. They're driving along and it's like, Put your stop. Just they'll go through the intersection. <laughs> so if the bad guys are chasing you, you have a brake. The vehicle will slow down. The vehicle will stop. That's another way that you can avoid or evade <laughs> getting hit by the bad guys. So know that, okay? All right. Uh, type J. Hey Rick, I just turned 14 and got my learners a few weeks ago. My dad is now teaching me how to drive a manual. Can you give me any tips on how to multitask? Because it is hard for me to focus. Okay. So type J. Multitasking is a myth, okay? I've talked to lots of neuroscientists and I've read lots of things. Uh, there's no such thing as multitasking. You can't do it. We need to focus on one thing at a time. So what I would suggest to you, type J, is you're learning how to drive manual. There's a few things that you need to do in sequential order. It seems like you're doing a lot of things at the same time, but you're not. You need to do things in sequential order, but the, 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 the sequence of events in terms of driving a manual transmission are so close together that it seems like you're doing a whole bunch of things at the same time when you're not. They're in sequential order. And in order to learn how to drive a manual well, you need to break down those different sequences so you can focus on one task at a time. And once you can focus on one task at a time, you're gonna find driving a manual transmission easier. All right, so uh, Corey will put the video up for you on manual transmission. Look at the first one and that will get you going 
uh, on driving a manual transmission and make it easier for you to learn how to drive a manual transmission. All right. Uh, or you might get into a crash. Uh, okay, Michael, I'm not following that conversation at all. All right. Okay, so what I said to you was I give you some examples. I've, I've had a few road rage incidences in my life. Uh, one of the road rage incidences that happened, and it was just me beaking off because I was under a lot of stress in my life. Uh, first time in my life I bought a house, we were moving, things were uncertain, you know, where was the money going to come from, those types of things. And I remember going <laughs> to a parking lot and, you know, I was on edge, things were happening in life that I kind of couldn't control. So I was already emotional distraught and know that sometimes when people get, you know, incidents of road rage, this is what happens. There's a lot of other things that are going on in their life. It's not just that you did something that upset them. It's the fact that there's other things going on in their life. And this person took my parking spot in a parking lot. And I got out of the car and I started yelling at them. Well, I would have never physically encountered them. I mean, once I started yelling at them and I got back in my car and I sat down, I was like, well, don't I feel like an ass? <laughs> and that's what happened. You know, the person didn't come over. The person didn't say anything. I'm sure the person was just like, oh, that guy's mean and vicious and ugly. But, uh, you know, as I said, there was a lot of other things going on in my life that caused me to explode in a parking lot at a perfect stranger and I felt totally horrible when I got back in my car. So that's me being aggressive to other people. Now I've had road rage incidences happen to me as well and one of them happened uh, at the beginning of going through my divorce. Uh, I was picking up my kids for Halloween. I was in another city, I was in Kamloops which was about an hour away and I came out of Kamloops and I got lost and I was running behind and I was coming back to Vernon to get my kids and I was running late you know driving fast faster than I should have been obviously and I come in through the parking lot where my kids were and it was pouring down rain I remember this it was pouring down rain and I come through the parking lot and there was somebody sitting across the parking lot so I couldn't go around finish going around and they were just sitting there they weren't moving and you know I waited five seconds and then I honked the horn and you know, it was probably a fairly aggressive honk on the horn. And I had hands on the steering wheel. The person got out of the van, walked across the parking lot to me, opened my driver's door and put their hand on my wrist here. And I just looked up at them and I just very calmly said to them, I said, you need to take your hand off me. And they let go of my hand, slammed the door, some expletives were <laughs> thrown at me. And that was it. He got back in his van and moved his van. I don't know why he was sitting there in the first place, but that's what happened. And that's the, that was the road rage. And I've had a few others too, but most of them were on my bicycle. <laughs> Seemed to have a lot of road rage incident on my bicycle. But that was the one that happened in my car. So, I mean, other smart drivers can share them as well and what happened with those and maybe some uh, incidents, uh, you know, you know, share those stories, go over to the mastermind group and on the Facebook page there and share those stories. And then we can pool that information and we can put it together and, you know, people will have ideas uh, and better strategies and techniques for specific road rage, rage incidents that may have happened to them. All right. Um, okay. Varun. How do I defuse a road rage situation if there are kids inside the vehicle? The, the, the best thing is Varun, as I said. Now, okay, and this is a good question. And this, and you know, how do you defuse a road rage situation? Oftentimes, if people see children in the vehicle, that's going to defuse the situation right there. Because people, you know, most people like myself, who <laughs> was emotionally distraught, got out, was yelling at a total stranger. If I saw kids in the car, I just kind of like, I'd sheepishly just walk away and, and just like, oh my God, I'm such a horrible person. Uh, if you have kids in the car, one of the things that you can do, which is prevention, so you don't get into that situation, and this comes back to the fundamentals of defensive driving. And again, the defensive driving course is over at the Smart Drive Test website. It's on sale right now for $17. You can pick that up. Defensive driving, the fundamentals of defensive driving, the fundamentals of keeping yourself on the roadway is space management, okay? Space management. So if you're not near other road users, uh, you're not near other drivers, other traffic on the roadway, it's less likely that you're going to encounter a road rage incident. The reason you're not going to encounter road rage incidents is because you're not near them. 
you're probably not going to cut them off. You're probably not going to be in their way. And therefore, you're probably not going to encounter a road rage incident. So this is one of the preventative measures that you can put in place to protect yourself, not only defensively for being involved in a crash, but also from being involved in a road rage incident and also from being involved in you know distracted driving, other drivers being distracted while they're driving because you have this huge buffer of space between you and other road users. Now, I know that that is more difficult during the holiday season because roads are busier, parking lots are busier and those types of things. But again, drive away. Don't make eye contact. Don't unlock the doors. Don't take pictures of the person. And if they do follow you, go to the police station. And if you have kids in the back, you know, kids know. Kids have, an, you know, they got an alert system that something's wrong. So if you're in the vehicle and you're being calm and you're not making eye contact and those kinds of things, you know, you can just tell them to be quiet if they're old enough to understand that kind of thing. But kids know. Kids instinctively know that there is something wrong and that you're trying to defuse a situation or you're trying to get yourself out of danger. So those are some techniques and strategies you can use in terms of having children in the vehicle. Uh, Carrie, uh, at night dusk, if you were driving normally and someone from behind you flashes their bright headlights at you multiple times, what is the best way to handle the situation? So Carrie, oftentimes if somebody's flashing their lights, the best thing to do at night is to simply slow down and let them pass you, especially if you're on a multi-lane road. If you are on a multi-lane road, get over to the right-hand lane, the slow lane, so that they can get out and get around you. But oftentimes what I suggest is to simply slow down and then that way they can pass you and they can go on with their life. Because oftentimes when people are flashing their lights behind you, it often means, I, A, you don't have your lights turned on and you should turn your lights on at night. And B, you're simply traveling at a speed that it, they consider too slow and that you're in their way. Okay? Stacy, hello my friend. How are you? Excellent. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, I get road rage so easily I cannot control it. <laughs> I uh, curse so much even if someone doesn't use their blinkers. Okay, Jamie, that's not really road rage. Uh, that's just you being a normal driver. <laughs> because even, even I get, I'm a taxi driver. <laughs> I'm a taxi driver, right? You know, and I mean, that's one of the things that unites us, you know, does, not just as smart drivers, but as drivers in the world is that uh, you know, we get we get bent out of shape by other people. Ah, that person's driving too slow. Ah, that person, look at that person go. They're an idiot. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you're just you're cussing other people and cursing them while you're driving in your vehicle, that's just you being a normal driver. But when you start chasing people down and you start, you know, aggressively driving around them, those types of things, then that's that's different. Then you're you're being aggressive and those types of things. But for the most part, you know, if you're cussing other drivers, that's just normal driving. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr Jamie, I drove in the fog a few weeks ago and I couldn't see anything. I didn't think uh, to turn on my hazard lights on, but I will next time. No, please don't, Jamie. <laughs> please don't. If you're in the fog or you're in snow and it's blinding snow and everybody's driving slowly, please don't turn your hazards on. It's very annoying to other drivers. I will be the driver that will be cursing you, Jamie. Okay, because I already know that I can't see. I already know that the, the visibility is poor. I know that other traffic is going to be driving slow. And your four-way flashers are not going to help me. They're just going to distract me and drive me nuts and encourage me to have a road rage incident. <laughs> I'm totally joking, Jamie. Just, no, don't turn your four-ways on. Just turn your lights on. Leave your lights on. That's all you do. Uh, if it's bad weather, it's foggy, you're having trouble with visibility, or you're in snow, no, don't. Turn your four ways on, okay? Uh, Stacy, you're not going to be happy with me. I was docked four points before even taking my road test in August. I tried to help my family and got in trouble driving with no license, but I'm still allowed to get my license. All right. <laughs> what did you do, Stacy? No, Stacy, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to judge you. I don't judge people, but hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully you're going to get your license. That's great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, Jamie, you don't have road rage. You're just no you're just normal like the rest of us. Okay. All right, Michael. Uh, all right, you got a lot of comments. I mean, if you, okay, 
Yeah, J Michael, you simply can't be reaching over in the vehicle getting for something. If you need to get something, you need to pull off the roadway into a parking lot, or you need to stop along the side of the road or whatnot. You simply need to stop so you can pick up whatever you need to off the off the off the pass you know the passenger foot well or whatnot. Don't try and reach over for it while you're driving your vehicle. You know if the thermos goes down there while you're on a road trip or something and you want a cup of coffee, you need to stop, pour yourself a cup of coffee, have your sandwich or whatnot, and then get back in the vehicle and carry on. Oftentimes we need to have the brake anyway, so that's the best thing to do. All right, there we go. Okay, excellent. So, if you have any questions about getting a license as well, we'll answer those. We have a few minutes left here. Uh, we'll answer questions about getting your license. Uh, basic road test rules, the four cornerstones of getting a license anywhere in the world, uh, regardless of what class of license you're going for, where you are in the world, or how old you are. Speed management, space management, observation, and communication are the four fundamentals of any road test. Not only are the four fundamentals of road test and being successful on a road test, there are also the four fundamental components of defensive driving. Yet again, I come back to space management as avoiding road rage and keeping yourself safe on the roadway. Okay, so space management. Don't get near other road users, other traffic, other drivers. That way, it's less likely that you're going to be involved in a crash. And you can always manage space in front of your vehicle. All right, so space management. Stop. At the correct stopping position at controlled intersections, often behind the stop line. If that doesn't exist, then crosswalk line or sidewalk. And if those two conditions don't exist, then at the edge where the two roads meet. And oftentimes you'll see that in residential areas or in uh, country areas, uh, you'll have that final condition for stopping at an intersection. Uh, stop in traffic so you can see the tires of the vehicle and making clear contact with the pavement. Following distances two to three seconds under ideal conditions in a passenger vehicle. For those of you driving trucks, large trucks, it's going to be up to five seconds. Don't block intersections. That is an automatic fail on a road test. Uh, if you enter an intersection and the light turns to yellow and goes to red and you are still sitting in the intersection, an automatic fail on a road test. So do not enter an intersection unless you can clear that intersection for the purposes of a road test. Speed management speed uh, posted speed limit or the flow of traffic whichever is less so if the flow of traffic say the speed limit is 30 miles an hour and the flow of traffic is only doing 20 well you can only do 20 okay get your vehicle up to speed as quickly as possible if you make a turn out onto a 30 mile an hour 50 kilometer an hour road get the vehicle up to 30 miles an hour as quickly as possible when you go around the corner all right Observation, you need to observe correctly when you're driving. And Corey, I put the video up for you about head movement because you have to move your head for the purposes of your road test. You can't observe correctly, especially in larger vehicles, without moving your head. You have to move your head. All right, so every eight to 12 seconds, you're gonna be looking far down the road. In, check your instrument panel, far down the road, both shoulders. In, check your center mirror. Down the road, check your wing mirror. Down the road, check the other wing mirror and repeat that every eight to 12 seconds. And that ties into speed control because if you're not adjusting your speed every eight to 12 seconds, it's telling the examiner that you're not observing correctly and not looking at your instrument panel and realizing that you're either going a little bit too fast or a little bit slow and making adjustments to your speed. So that's observation driving in a straight line. Anytime that you turn or move the vehicle sideways, you have to shoulder check 90 degrees. For turns, Approximately half a block before the turn, you're going to shoulder check, and then immediately before the turn, you're going to shoulder check. Uh, lane changes. Immediately, you're going to check your mirror, mirror signal, shoulder check, and signal, shoulder check. You're going to find the space, three flashes on the signal, shoulder check again, and then begin to move over. And you need to accelerate slightly as you're changing lanes because you're going on a diagonal and you're going to cover more distance. Therefore, you've got to increase your speed to make up for that uh, increased distance. Uh, and then reversing 360 degree scan around the vehicle look out the back window and back up You can use your backup camera and your wing mirrors as an auxiliary every vehicle length Stop the vehicle pause 360 degree scan and then look out the back window and continue to back up again So that's observation and finally communication you need to communicate effectively with other road users through lights and signals your horn, use your horn sparingly because unfortunately it's seen as a sign of aggression in this day and age and people may see it as road rage. So use it aggressively, just like tap, tap. If somebody's, for example, somebody doesn't go at a green light and the green lights, it's been green for a couple of seconds, just tap your horn, tap, tap, beep, beep. 
and then they'll go, right? Don't like, because <laughs> that will definitely start a road rage instant <laughs> because if it was me, <laughs> I'd just put the car in to secure the vehicle, put the parking brake, and I'd get out, and I'd walk up, and I'd just be like, then I would look at you in traffic and wait for the light to cycle through. <laughs> and then we would <laughs> have a road rage instant. Anyway, I digress. So horn, using the horn nicely. Uh, hand signals, hand gestures, uh, use all five fingers to, you know, wave somebody on or whatnot. Don't tell them they're number one on a road test. Eye contact. If you have a pedestrian, you're not sure what they're doing. Get eye contact before you move out. And then, uh, the last one is position of your vehicle on the roadway is going to, uh, indicate what you're going to do. For example, if you're in the left-hand turning lane with your vehicle, the chances are very high that you're going to make a left-hand turn. So, and as well, talking about freeways and getting out onto the acceleration lane, uh, lots of people will say to me, well, what if it's backed up traffic and I can't get out on the freeway and they won't create a space? Okay, signal early. As soon as you're on the on-ramp, put your signal on, stay on the acceleration lane until about halfway down. If the space doesn't materialize or you didn't judge it right, you didn't aim for the space, <coughs> excuse me, then what you need to do is you need to keep your signal on and then crowd the left side of your lane. As soon as you start crowding that left side of the lane, it's going to say to other people, oh, wait a minute, that person's coming over and all of a sudden now they're going to create space for you get to allow you to get out onto the, out onto the roadway. Now, no, the onus of responsibility for merging onto the freeway is the merging vehicle, but the traffic on the freeway or highway should also slow down a little bit to allow you to merge or they should move over if that is possible as well. Yes, they don't have to. I know that the law says that. However, we're smart drivers, we're courteous, it's the holiday season and it doesn't take any time out of your day to be nice to people. So if you can move over, move over and allow vehicles to merge out or simply take your foot off the throttle, cancel the cruise, slow down two miles an hour because oftentimes the difference between somebody merging successfully onto a freeway is that vehicle that's coming up behind them simply letting off the throttle two miles an hour and they slow down two or three miles an hour and all of a sudden the vehicle in front of them accelerates and accelerates on, on the freeway and carries on with their life and nobody had a road rage incident. So that's the last way, position of your vehicle on the roadway. So space management, speed management, communication, observation, those are the four fundamental components of passing a road test and staying safe and being defensive driver when you're driving. All right, and Corey got those videos up for you. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, Carrie, anxious about driving in the winter time due to slick icy roads. Your winter driving course is a great one and looking forward to understanding it better. Thanks for your great support of your courses. Yes, and I need to answer your email, Carrie. I will get that to you in the next day or so. I'll try not, I'm a bit a little tardy on that. I apologize. Uh, Michael, does it still count as running a red light even though you don't get a ticket? <laughs> uh, Michael, it's only illegal if you get caught. Okay? But it's still dangerous, okay? If you run a red light, I would strongly encourage you not to run red lights because you potentially could be involved in a crash. And if you're involved in a T-bone crash, the chances of you being killed or seriously injured are high, all right? Uh, Stacy, my only issue now is parking and lining up and backing into a space, mainly parking and staying lined up in a lane. I, I get too far to the, to the right. Okay, so Stacy, I might encourage you to revisit the fundamentals and go back to working with the pylons in the parking lot. All right, Jamie, I like driving fast, but don't always go fast as I don't want to lose control. I have my driver's license for a year now and love the privilege to drive. Yes, it's awesome, and going fast is is fun. <laughs> yes, especially here in BC where we can drive 120 on the Trans-Canada. Actually, you can drive 130, and the police will still leave you alone. 130, for those of you in the States, is about 80 miles an hour. It's, it's awesome. But you have places in the States you can drive 80 miles an hour on the interstate, too. And those are awesome places. All right, Aaron, live in Michigan, taking my road test in January. Any suggestions or tips? Yes, definitely. Uh, Aaron, Corey, I'll put the video up for you on the Pass Your Road Test playlist. All the stuff in there you need is there as well. Aaron, I just went over the four fundamental components of passing a road test. Just back the video up a little bit and, and check those out. Space management, speed management, observation, and communication. All right. So we're just getting near the end here. So be sure if you are going for a road test, head over to the Smart Drive Test website and pick up this checklist. Uh, you can find that down in the description, I believe. If not, Corey will put the link up for you. Uh, this will give you a checklist of things that you need to do leading up to your road test. 
day of your road test, what you need to do, what you should bring, positive thinking, determination. And just uh, one other point that I will make uh, that was brought up by a CDL driver today who was unsuccessful on their road test in Ontario. When you go for your road test, you need to have a little bit of tenacity, a little bit of determination. Some might call it self-confidence, but I would call it a little bit of determination that you're gonna pass, you're gonna do what you need to do, and you need to know that what you are doing is right, it's what you were taught, and you know that these are the steps that you need to put in place in order to be successful on your road test. What happened was this, the student went to a CDL driving school, learned a certain method of doing the pre-trip inspection, and then when they went for their road test, the driving examiner kind of messed them up a little bit and gave them some direction, which was contrary to what they had learned. Uh, you can do what you need to do on a road test. Uh, as long as you're safe, you do everything according to the rules of being safe on the roadway, space management, speed management, observation, communication. You know, if you can back up the car uh, and parallel park and you have complete and total control of the vehicle, you back up slowly, you have control of the wheel, you're looking out the back window and you can do it without finding the 45 degree angle, then you don't need to find the 45 degree angle. You don't need to do all the steps and procedures that you need to do that I have in the parallel park video here on the channel. If you can do it without any of that, then that's fine. This is not school in math where we got to show all our work. <laughs> you just got to be able to produce the end result, which is to show the examiner that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing traffic conditions. And yes, of course, there's a few other things for CDL drivers, but if you can do that, you're going to be successful on a road test. So when you go down, know that what you are doing is correct. It's what you were taught, and you're simply demonstrating a competency to the examiner. Don't let the examiner kind of get in there and move you around a little bit and throw you off your game, okay? Because if they throw you off your game, unfortunately, it kind of messes you up, and, and sometimes it causes smart drivers to fail, all right? Okay, uh, Jamie, I love driving the Coke. Yes, the Coquihalla Highway here in BC. It's great. Uh, <laughs> no, Jamie, the tires won't blow up very often. Uh, however, I am going to put a video up. I had a, a semi truck go around a corner and a big chunk of ice came off it. That was pretty cool. Uh, Ryan loves driving. Awesome. Thanks for your wisdom. Jamie, thanks so much for your knowledge on the road. You're absolutely, you're most welcome. And all about vehicles is going for the G license soon. That is absolutely tremendous. And if you have any questions about passing a road test, getting your CDL license, or just remaining safe, defensive driving, uh, definitely leave us a comment down in the comment section, especially if you're watching on the replay. Uh, love to engage with the smart drivers and help you out. And uh, if you have, a, if you've passed a road test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations on that. And if you have a road test coming up in the next week or two, good luck on that. Uh, and be sure to stop back and let us know how it goes. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.